Okay, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, I'm so happy to have such a nice turnout this morning considering the weather. Um, for those of you uh, who have not been to one of our talks before, um, welcome. This is one of our part of our Case Downtown Lecture Series. And we are still doing these for another couple months. I believe they go through May. So feel free to go on our website and take a look at the future topics if you'd like to come back and visit us again. Um, I will be doing, as you know, about an hour presentation today. And I've been asked to wait till the end um, to take questions just because we are doing a webcast. So it's easier for those watching to follow if we wait until the end. Um, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get started on um, the topic of today, which is differences between male and female communication styles in the legal profession. Um, I just want to make a few disclaimers <laughs> before we get started. Um, first of all, realize that I focused on the differences between female and male communication styles. There's many, many similarities, as you can imagine, between male and female communication styles that I certainly don't have time to go into. Um, so, and I also based my research on um, studies, books that have been written on this topic. Um, so some of the generalizations or some of the findings may not be something that you agree with. Some of them probably will. Um, obviously, each person, whether you be man or woman, has your own unique experiences and um, personality um, with respect to what you've run across, with respect to societal norms and um, different folks um, of either gender. I will start just real quickly with a glimpse at courtroom proceedings, um, since we are focusing on in the legal profession. And I did this just because it's a nice place to kind of hold the mirror up to ourselves as a legal profession, where you see kind of a cross-section of lawyers. You're going against opposing counsel. You're meeting a lot of different judges, legal secretaries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a nice place to kind of look at ourselves as a legal profession. And then also, you can hold the mirror up to society um, here at um, the courtroom, because of course, you get a real cross-section of society, hopefully, um, coming in to serve on our juries. When we talk about jury perceptions of different types of communication. Um, generally, what I found with respect to courtroom communication is that female trial attorneys often are in what's called a double bind. Um, what this means is that if they come off as being too aggressive or too assertive, um, they have the real danger of alienating a jury or alienating a judge or um, opposing counsel um, because they come off as being kind of unreasonable, uh, volatile, um, emotional. Um, often the B word is used um, in a lot of these studies with respect to this. Um, however, if um, they act too feminine, and if what we consider the more feminine norm, um, they're often considered more helpless, lacking authority, lacking direction, et cetera. So um, many female attorneys have reported, especially based on these studies and feedback that they've gotten, is that um, it's difficult, and that hence the double bind of how to walk that tightrope. Um, with respect to appearance, um, by and large, women are much more likely to be judged on appearance than men. Um, now I feel like you're all looking at me to see what I look like. No. Um, but um, uh, in one study, for instance, when they asked, are you likely to judge someone based on appearance, um, they only said yes for males about 15.9% of the time. Um, but for females, it was 62.7. So a really huge difference between males and females with respect to this particular um, form of communication. With respect to demeanor, women are expected to smile more often. Um, it's pretty much come up in every study that that's something that's kind of expected. Again, kind of a societal norm. And I'll talk about where some of that has come from as we move along. Um, and generally, judges, juries, everyone expects a little bit more niceness um, is often the term from women than from men. They expect that women are going to be more cordial, even in the courtroom, even when cross-examining, um, which makes cross-examination especially tricky for female attorneys. Um, in the courtroom, uh, male trial attorneys are generally considered more credible, um, according to the studies. And this has panned out regardless of how the, their female counterparts performed. So even if the female 
attorneys perform better or maybe even had better results um, or demonstrated greater ability. Generally, the male attorneys have the benefit of being considered more credible just by the mere fact that they're male. Um, with respect to aggressiveness as a specific trait, um, this is considered an admirable trait for male attorneys. Um, it's rarely criticized with respect to male attorneys, um, but often criticized with respect to female attorneys. And some commentators have said that this kind of traces back to some of our stereotypical norms that while the male attorney is, or the male in any profession, um, is, has more at stake in the profession, has more at stake in that particular um, trial or that particular case, because they're traditionally considered the breadwinners of the family. Um, some of the judiciary also, um, judiciary or um, other members of the profession um, fail to treat female lawyers in a wholly professional manner. Um, this can range from not being included in pretrial discussions to the same extent that male attorneys are. Um, when back in chambers, a lot of female attorneys felt that they were left out of the guy talk that took place back in chambers um, and, and those sorts of situations. Um, one story that in one of uh, the um, uh, women Don't Ask, which is one of the great books about the differences between men and women with respect to communication. Um, a United States District Court judge, she didn't say which district she was from, but she did say that she was appointed to a district where there's 13 judges, and all of them prior to her appointment were male. Um, once she was appointed, she was also appointed with another female um, appointee and they had their first big meeting with the 13 judges and they went through a bunch of um, different very important matters that they had to discuss and she contributed along with her um, female colleague and she said she noticed at the end that when the chief judge was summarizing everyone's comments he said okay judge smith had this to add um, judge sloan had this to add and then for the two women he just said and elaine and susan had this to add um, so things like that where you see um, Again, it can sometimes be very subtle, um, but it's something that troubled her a little bit, seeing as she was just arriving on the bench in the district court. Um, with respect to more globally, just male-female interactions in the workplace. So this can include the courthouse, but it also can include the office, pretrials, client meetings, etc. cetera. Um, there is a real difference, generally, excuse me, um, according to studies between uh, psychological and sociological studies have looked at the difference between how men and women feel comfortable communicating, especially in mixed group settings, since in our profession, that's generally the way that it goes. I mean, generally there's going to be both males and females um, engaged in a trial, engaged in um, a pretrial meeting, um, engaged in a meeting with a, a client, etc. With respect to men, they were found to be three times more likely to interrupt um, when they're in a mixed group setting, um, so they don't have a problem kind of asserting themselves. Um, they're less facially expressive, so their face does not always give away um, what they're thinking with respect to um, how the meeting or how the particular transaction is going. And they speak using louder voices. And what I mean by this is not just that males might have um, a natural louder voice, but they generally are not afraid to speak up and have their voice resonate more than women in the same situations. Um, also, with respect to men, they talk more. In other words, they, with respect to quantity, um, they talk more in mixed group situations. Um, they also tend to generalize. In other words, they'll feel comfortable, especially when they're summing up, if they have an opinion on how the case should go or they have an opinion on what course we should teach. Um, they'll feel comfortable summarizing and assuming that everyone else is along with them. Um, everyone's um, on board with me um, with respect to where we're going. So they feel comfortable often speaking for others, even if the others have not already um, explicitly agreed with them. Um, men are also more likely to issue directives. In other words, tell people what needs to be done um, and even go so far as to assign um, particular tasks. That's something that mu is much more um, in the male realm and something that they feel much more comfortable with. Um, they're more often um, likely to ignore 
the communication of others. So while, um, and I'll talk about the differences with women, um, but while women um, generally tune in a little bit more, even if it's something that they don't agree with, um, men are found to more often, again, this doesn't mean always, um, ignore communication that um, they don't find um, to be pleasing for them. Um, so overall, on leadership qualities, most of the studies find that when you look at leadership qualities and you ascribe that to either male or female, um, that men are generally considered more as the natural leaders in just regular everyday interactions, including business meetings, etc. For women, on the other hand, they tend to speak for themselves, um, so they don't feel as comfortable saying that, okay, my views apply to everyone else here. I'm just going to speak for myself here, um, and here's what I think we should do, or here's what I believe is the right course to take. Um, they're more likely to hedge, to say things like sort of, I'm not sure. Um, in other words, they beat around the bush. They're not as likely to get straight to the point with respect to the point that they want to make. Um, they also will ask tag questions, often at the end of their point. So don't you think? Do you agree? Am I wrong in thinking this? Um, those type of questions that then throw it back to the other person um, to have the power to say whether or not their contributions were worthy. Um, so essentially less direct and less confident with their speech patterns. Um, Women also smile more often than men, so they live up to society's expectations of them, where generally they do smile uh, much more often. They're more likely to do, um, disclose personal information, so they're more likely in a work setting or um, even in a courtroom setting to talk about the fact that you know they have small children, maybe their spouse is doing this or that. Um, it's something that comes up more often um, in women's discussions than with men in the workplace. And then finally, um, compared to men who are not as facially expressive, um, women tend to really try to encourage others by speaking or nodding or providing some type of verbal reinforcement. Um, so when someone else is speaking, they pay, they're a little bit more tuned in and paying more attention to making sure that that person feels comfortable in that particular environment. And the result is that women end up getting less airtime in meetings, they're, they have less with respect to volume in meetings, and they're generally considered less dominant in meetings. Um, again, this is a generalization, um, and conversations involving men. Um, now, some of the studies have even said that this is not necessarily such a bad thing. If you have someone who's overly dominant um, and who dominates the whole conversation and tries to speak for everyone, um, he or she can turn the rest of the room off um, more than someone who tends to get less airtime and is less dominant. So again, it's a tightrope that we have to walk, all of us have to walk when we're in the business setting with respect to how we communicate with our peers, how we communicate our views to our peers, um, even in instances, especially in the law, where we often don't agree with <coughs> our peers in certain situations. Um, and a lot of the studies talk about the fact that this goes back to childhood socialization. Um, when you think about when you were a boy or you were a girl, or if you have um, young boys or girls, uh, I have twins that are boy-girl twins, so it's interesting for me to watch them and watch the way that they socialize and the way that they communicate um, compared, to, um, other, uh, compared to each other. And um, we were just talking about, is it nature or is it nurture? And some things, I look at them and I say, oh, they were just born that way. He, you know, he likes trucks and she likes dolls. Um, but to a certain extent, there's a socialization that takes place very early on with boys and girls, especially with respect to how they play. Uh, when you think about most girls' games, and certainly this is what I see with my children, um, is that the girls' games, they tend to, to play in smaller groups. They tend to cluster and have their closer friends that they cluster with. Um, they love to play things like house or school. 
um, and communicate and interact with each other. Um, they like um, a lot of pretend, a lot of make-believe, so not necessarily clear-cut rules. They don't have to have clear-cut rules for their play. Um, when you watch little girls play, communication is a huge part of their play. So they're talking back and forth with each other a lot. Um, sometimes even if they're by themselves, they're talking um, quite a bit. Um, generally, there's a, a view to try to make everyone happy when you see little girls play. So in other words, they're avoiding um, criticism, they're avoiding conflicts. If there is some type of conflict, they quickly try to work it out so that everyone is happy. Um, the goal is not to exclude or outdo others. Um, so generally, young girls are not saying, oh, I'm going to be the best at being the mom this time, or um, I'm going to be um, the best at jumping rope this time. That's not as important for girls as for boys. Um, so generally, it's much more bigger attention, much more attention to fostering relationships um, and the fact that there's no winners or losers. We're all, um, we're all here together to have a good time. Um, this type of socialization prepares women for a certain type of communication at work. So when women get into the workplace, they're prepared for a certain type of communication that tends to be more interactional. Um, they care more about their relationships with other people um, in the workplace. Uh, their participatory and collaboration, again, just like with respect to the games that they played earlier, um, they expect collaboration in the workplace. They expect that everyone's going to try to get along. Um, women's notions of how the workplace um, should work often appeal to equity and fair play. Women much more have that sense, whereas men have more of an individualist approach. Women feel that um, th things should be equal, um, things should be fair, more of a meritocracy. Um, now when we switch to boys, they tend to congregate in larger groups. Um, so when you see boys playing basketball, baseball, even war, um, it tends to, it's not necessarily just two of them, it tends to be a larger group. Um, and there's a hierarchy. There's often, I know for my sons when they talk about at recess, it's always whose team is whose and who's the captain of the team. That's the most important thing at recess each day. Um, so there's this real hierarchy and dominancy with respect to how they play. Um, they generally have a competition and there's clear cut rules. So even if it's some type of battle or war, someone loses, um, someone dies in that particular, <laughs> in that particular game. So there are um, winners and losers uh, with respect to that socialization for young boys. And this prepares men for a different type of communication at work. So they're prepared to be more authoritative. Um, they've already taken on leadership roles earlier on in their childhood, and they're, they're comfortable with issuing demands. Um, argumentative. Arguments don't um, bother them as much as they do for women, and we'll talk a little bit more um, about that in a few minutes. Um, but it's something that allows them, um, allows men, um, to be more independent and to focus more on their individual needs, on what their individual needs are. Um, so generally, they're more likely to cut to the chase and go for the jugular with respect to communications in the workplace. They're not as worried about getting along with everyone in the workplace with respect to interactions. Um, another topic that is very different and marked between the communication of men and women is negotiation. Obviously, negotiation is a huge part of the legal profession. It's a huge part of what we do. Um, but I'm being even more global um, and not just referring to negotiating with opposing counsel, um, but also maybe negotiating for a fee with your client negotiating with your secretary to get her to stay late. Um, every single day we have the opportunity, often multiple opportunities, uh, to engage in some type of negotiation, uh, whether you take on a new case, um, or give it to someone else in the firm, um, all the way up to negotiating your yearly bonus or your salary if you feel like you're not happy with what you've been offered. Generally, with negotiations, women don't see as many opportunities out there for 
negotiations. Um, essentially, it's something that women don't look for to the same extent as men. Um, you'll even hear some people will say, everything's negotiable. Um, that's not necessarily a common precept held by women. Uh, women tend to see many fewer opportunities to negotiate um, in just day-to-day -day activities. Um, on one study that looked at and ranked a lot of different things and said, is this type of thing negotiable, is this type of thing negotiable, they found that women were generally 45% more likely to score low on the negotiation scale. In other words, to say, that that's not, I don't see that as negotiable, um, whereas the men um, were much more likely to see that. Um, so certainly less likely to see things as negotiable. Um, women are much more loath to engage in negotiations, especially, I mean, there's a difference sometimes when you're engaging in negotiation on behalf of your client. You don't have a choice and you're representing someone else, um, but they are loath to engage in negotiations in everyday life. I was just at um, Verizon the other day getting a charger for my cell phone and one of my friends um, from uh, that sends her kids to school with my kids um, was there and her husband was there because I ended up being there waiting for about a half an hour. He was haggling with them for about a half an hour on what the proper phone plan is and he was saying, well, if you don't give me this, then I'll go here and blah, blah, blah. And his wife was so embarrassed. She's like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe he's doing this. This is so, like women really tend to find a lot of that type of negotiation and hassling um, distasteful. Uh, so when men were asked, when men and women were asked how they describe the experience of negotiating, men were more likely to use the words like fun and exciting. Women <laughs> were more likely to use words like scary and distasteful. Um, so it really shows, this is definitely an area with respect to interactions that there's a huge difference between men and women. Um, indeed, men ask for or initiate negotiations two to three times more often than women. Um, even something as big as starting a new job. One study asked respondents, um, they put this statement to the respondents and said, um, answer whether or not you agree. And the statement was, um, you shouldn't just accept the salary you're offered when you take a new job. You should negotiate and you should tell your new employer what you're worth. And with respect to this statement, 85% of the men agreed with the statement and said, yes, absolutely, you should tell them what you're worth. You shouldn't just accept the salary that you're given. Only 17% of the women agreed um, in this particular study. Indeed, a more recent study of Carnegie Mellon um, students backed this up where they watched a graduating class of students from Carnegie Mellon and then asked them once they got their first jobs, how many of you negotiated your salary compared to just took what you got, um, what you were given? And eight times as many men as women um, of the graduates negotiated their starting salaries. So very few of the women in that particular study um, took advantage of the possibility to negotiate their starting salary. And again, this often, when I was reading um, books and studies on this, a lot of the women, when they were telling anecdotal stories of what happened to them, um, said it goes back to their socialization. And for instance, one senior manager at a corporation said, look, my first job and my job that I had for the first few years um, until I got to be college age was babysitting. That's what most of us teenage girls did. And um, she said, when I did, went for my first job, so I called and made the arrangements with the uh, mother. And the mother said, what do you charge? And I had no idea what to say. I don't know what I'm supposed to charge. So I asked my mom, and, she, and her mom told her, just tell her to pay you whatever they think is fair. That, that's why, how it should go. And we will complain in our neighborhood when we're trying to get sitters that none of our sitters will generally give us a rate. So we have to kind of ask around to say, how much are we supposed to pay a 13-year-old compared to a 16-year-old? Um, it's generally something that you know, even young women find very distasteful. They don't feel comfortable saying, OK, here's my hourly rate for babysitting. Um, but when you look at boys, certainly boys in my neighborhood um, who start their little shoveling or their lawn business um, ventures, they'll put their little flyers in your mailbox and they have a set rate. They don't have a problem saying this is what I'm worth for the work that I'm going to do. Um, so it starts fairly young and again like with respect to that, that's their kind of first venture out into the workplace 
And to a certain extent, like in this case, this um, corporate executive was somewhat socialized by her mother um, to not ask for something, because that's rude. That's not good manners to say, OK, well, I deserve $7 an hour. Um, instead, just pay me whatever you think is, um, is fair. Once they do engage in negotiations, some studies show that women are less competitive um, and tend to agree to lower outcomes relative to men. Um, now, this is often because women feel uncomfortable in the situation, so are willing to walk away with less than they could have gotten otherwise. Excuse me. Um, however, the good news for us as attorneys is that um, women do tend to do better when they're negotiating on behalf of someone else. So it goes back to that interactional, relational um, aspect for women that um, when they're fighting on behalf of someone else and when they care about someone else's needs, it's much easier for them. They don't feel as uncomfortable fighting on behalf of someone else than they do um, negotiating or fighting for their own needs. Um, and a lot of the studies have said that this tends to stem from a lack of confidence, not necessarily a lack of ability on behalf of women. Um, we even looked, and some of the studies even looked at female law students in negotiating formats. And a lot of them would have very good outcomes with respect to their negotiation. But then when asked to rate their abilities, they generally rated their abilities much lower than their male counterparts, um, which, again, um, is an issue with respect to how women are socialized and how they tend to view themselves in those type of situations. Especially if women don't feel comfortable in a certain area, um, women tend to uh, report a lot of um, discomfort in bluffing, for one, um, if someone's gonna, whether or not someone's going to call their bluff. Um, working with numbers, um, throwing out numbers very quickly, um, and not just with respect to the math aspect, but again, because a lot of women find that distasteful to talk about, um, to talk too much about numbers. Um, Finally, as I'm sure some of you are aware, and this is not something that's just for women, but women tend to rank much higher on the scale of saying, I take on way too much. I have a real problem with saying no when someone comes and asks me to do something. So um, for instance, in the firm that I worked at before I started teaching, um, the, the um, the female associates would tend to, because they have that real desire to please people, they have that real desire to try to get along, um, so they have a real problem with saying no. If a case comes across their desk, they try to figure out some way to do it, um, even if it means staying up till 3 in the morning. Um, while men tend to be a little bit more assertive in saying, no, this is what I already have with respect to their workload. Um, again, I, I mentioned um, this great book, that probably a lot of you are familiar with by Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashover, um, which is called Women Don't Ask, which is probably the biggest difference between negotiation styles um, and communication styles between men and women, is that women just don't even think or don't see the opportunities or don't want to seize the opportunities um, to negotiate in certain everyday opportunities. Again, it's not just in those settlement conferences or negotiating something as big as your salary or your yearly bonus. And uh, Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashever uh, looked at this and asked a lot of women and did a lot of anecdotal studies and found that there were certain kind of three basic reasons why women feel uncomfortable asking. So even if they feel like um, they should, they don't. Um, first of all, women are much more likely, as I mentioned before, to see life as a meritocracy. So they start their job, they work hard, they keep their head down um, and do what they're supposed to do, and they assume that that'll be rewarded. Whereas men don't necessarily have the same approach. Um, they realize that sometimes you have to point out your accomplishments rather than expecting that they're automatically going to be recognized. Women also have a fear, a greater fear of making mistakes. Um, this is probably, again, a comfort factor. If they're not used to communicating in this particular manner, um, they don't really want to put themselves out there and possibly make a mistake when negotiating. Um, for instance, for maybe for us as professors, we have to negotiate speaker fees, those type of things. Um, it's uncomfortable, and sometimes you don't know, oh, am I asking too much? Am I alienating them that way? Or am I asking too little, making it seem like I'm not worth anything? There's all those things that kind of swirl around in your head 
um, in deciding whether or not you want to negotiate or just offer what they give you. And then finally, a real fear of hurting relationships. Um, women care about this much more than men um, with respect to how they get along with their counterparts, how they get along with their bosses, um, how they get along with their clients. Um, so they don't feel comfortable necessarily going in and maybe demanding a higher salary or demanding that bigger office, even if they know intuitively and um, with all assurances that they deserve it. Uh, because they don't want to make waves. They don't want to be known for making waves. They want to be known for someone who is congenial um, and who is nice to work with in um, most aspects. So generally for women, women see negotiation as a conflict um, and something that they're generally averse to with respect to um, asking for things. Women take a much more relational care-based approach to resolving conflicts, while men take much more of an individual rights approach. Um, one of my favorite stories is from the Women Don't Ask book, where um, it's probably one of my favorites because it's about a female professor, but a female professor who ranked very highly in her department um, found out <coughs> kind of surreptitiously that she was making way less than the male professors in her department, and she was you know, completely shocked by this since she brought in by far the greatest amount of grant money to the department, uh, as well as was asked to speak uh, much more often than um, her male counterparts. And so she went home and she put together her whole proposal and put together her whole biography and went to s and sent it to the dean ahead of time. And then went and set up this meeting with the dean and said, here are all the reasons why I think I deserve a raise. And the dean said, um, oh, OK, fine. And she said, well, why wasn't I making this all along? Why was I making less than my male counterparts? And he said, you didn't ask for it. So I assumed you didn't care. Um, he actually said to her, I didn't think you were materialistic is what he said to her. And she said, materialistic, I have two kids I have to send through college. So yeah, give me the money. I'll take the money. Um, so it definitely, you know, she, her point was, I didn't have to put in all this work. I really just had to ask for it and show my worth. Um, and I would have gotten it um, with respect to that. Um, and often, this is something that um, is uncomfortable for women. The good thing for women, though, um, and for men, is when you do take um, the initiative and actually go ahead and ask for it, um, you're generally more respected as a result. Um, so it often has the converse result that women fear, which is that it's going to cause some type of wave or some type of stir or conflict. Um, often, by asking for that bigger office or asking for that raise, you're showing, hey, I'm worth more than this. I know that I'm worth than this, more than this, and I'm confident in that, um, that I can stand up to anyone here, be he man or be she woman, um, and that I can compete. So often it has a much better um, result than if you never asked at all. Uh, okay, so now I'd like to spend a little bit of time on talking about how to address some of these imbalances, whether, again, you're a man or a woman. If you fall into any of these categories where, um, that are more generally ascribed to women, um, what are some of the things you can do to um, take care of some of these imbalances, um, even if they're subtle imbalances in your communications with males or females in a work setting? Um, first of all, take advantage of your women's in intuition. And again, this is a complete generalization, um, but um, and many men have great intuition as well. But this is not just a mystique that um, there's such thing as women's intuition. Studies show that women are better decoders of emotional feedback from others, um, nonverbal communication from others, so they are better able to read um, people's face. They're better able to read the room, um, which often can be a real benefit if you're a trial attorney and you're dealing with juries. Um, the fact that you can get a sense of, OK, I may be turning this juror off, or this, um, this judge might not be too swayed by what I'm saying right now in oral argument. Um, they're better able, generally, to read the client or read the judge. Um, don't be a silent observer. So even if you don't have a ton to say, think of something to say when you're in a mixed group setting. Generally, just being a fly on the wall doesn't engender a lot of confidence for what your abilities are or um, what 
your suggestions are um, for how to go further. So studies show that for those who just sit there quietly, um, generally when you leave there, you're going to be given less responsibility um, and less credit than those who spoke up and made their views known. Um, so generally, even within the first 10 minutes of the meeting, find something to say. Um, not, hopefully not something idiotic, but something um, to say that will make it clear that I'm here, I have something to contribute, and there's a reason why I'm here. Um, sometimes I'm in meetings and there's two or three people who just sit there every single time and don't say anything. And I wonder, you know, do they, are they listening? Do they have a reason for being here? Um, so you want to make it clear that, you know, you're there as a participant for a particular purpose and um, you have something important to say. Try not to preface your remarks with qualifiers, um, such as, I'm not sure if you'd agree with me, or this might be out of left field, but here's my suggestion. Um, uh, let me say, let me add my two cents worth, but this is only um, from my opinion. Um, those type of things tend to, rather than get people to perk up, it tends to have people tune you out with respect to what you're going to say. Um, so instead, try things like roadmaps with respect to where you're going to go in your particular comments. Um, so hopefully that will tell the audience where you're headed. So I disagree with that and here's three reasons why. Or here's three reasons why we should move for summary judgment rather than um, doing a motion to dismiss right now at this point in um, the proceedings. Um, also, a roadmap that shows the audience that you're confident, um, that you have support for your ideas. And this is something that women tend to also um, suffer with respect to a lack of doing this. So saying things like, based on studies I've read, um, uh, based on a case I worked on with similar facts, this is where, where I think we should go here based on my prior dealings with this particular judge. So again, you're making it clear, instead of having a qualifier where someone wants to tune you out, you're having a roadmap where the audience is gonna perk up and pay more attention because you're telling them what your expertise is, um, what your qualifications are before you even speak up. Um, so it generally tends to have the opposite effect of what most of us often do in um, meeting um, aspects. Think about ways to deal with interruptions. Um, interruptions are a matter of life, and all of us interrupt others at one point or another. But if you do have a constant interrupter who's not letting you get the word in edgewise, um, think about how you can be assertive without completely alienating the whole room, not saying, hey, you, I was talking. Um, that generally isn't a great way to communicate um, the fact that you're annoyed that someone is interrupting you. Um, but things like, let me finish my thought. Um, you'll, I, I would love to hear what you have to say, but I'm still in the middle of um, explaining my point here. Um, so trying to think of ways that you're not just going to yield the floor to an interrupter. As I said, generally, since men are three times more likely to interrupt, um, that's part of the reason that they end up getting much more airtime with respect to um, meetings and with respect to any type of proceedings. Avoid asking for <laughs> approval. So a lot of um, women focus on, um, I, I don't know if I'm worthy, I don't know if I should say something. Um, focus on your ideas instead of your value um, as a presenter. So for instance, Rather than, did I get my point across, um, you would say something like, can I add anything further to what I said? Um, I could get you my notes if there's still any question on how to proceed. So you're making it clear that here's my opinion, um, and I'm not going to disclaim my opinion after I've stated it, which is often a problem with women as well. They'll do a qualifier before, and then a disclaimer after, saying, um, have I been clear enough? Um, again, giving the other person the greater power to say, no, and here's my opinion, and moving on. So in that way, you're making it clear that you stand behind what you've said and that you feel comfortable with that particular communication. Um, offer to give them more. Don't offer to take back what you said um, is a good way to think about it. Um, it's a good way to kind of leave the listener when you're walking out of a meeting or when you're walking out of a pretrial. That's the offer that you should be making. A 
avoid taking disagreements or interruptions personally. Uh, this is difficult for women generally, and the anecdotal studies that we looked at, a lot of women said that if people disagreed with them, um, whether it was a man or a woman, uh, it tended to make them very uncomfortable, um, even in a work setting. So it's something that you have to focus on, and I try to tell my law students, um, I know I teach writing, and at the beginning of the year, I put up a few slides kind of introducing them to the year. Um, and one of the things I put up is that you will be criticized. There's no doubt, like every single one of you will be criticized so that you understand that and you don't take it personally because a lot of them are crushed the first time that they see um, something marked up. Most of them came from colleges where they got straight A's and they're writing. Um, a lot of them maybe could even wait till midnight the night before and write something and still crank out an A paper. And that's what they're used to. Um, that's not the case in the legal profession, you have to put a lot more, as you know, work into your written word, since generally that's the way that you're getting your point across to the judge. Um, so for that reason, I try to prepare my law students for that early on. And it's something that we want to be prepared for as well in the workplace to not take those kind of things um, personally. Publicizing credentials. This is something that, again, women tend to feel very uncomfortable um, in this arena. So for instance, if a woman just won a big case or a woman was asked to speak at a particular um, bar association event, women are much less likely to drop that in conversation than men. Men feel more comfortable saying um, that here are my credentials and here's what I'm doing. Um, it's just not something, it's not that women necessarily intentionally avoid it, it's just that it doesn't occur to them to do something like that. Um, again, it, can sometimes depend on the individual and where you find your self-worth with respect to what you're involved with. Um, but if you do want to focus on getting ahead and letting people know that you are out there doing things um, and you are having real successes, um, it is a good thing to weave into conversations. Um, I just gave the example that when you're in a mixed group setting and you're meeting on a particular topic, um, that might be a nice place to say, look, I had a big case with this judge and I had really successful results doing such and such. So you're not only saying, here's my credentials, but you're also saying um, that I've had this success. So you're kind of buffering yourself with respect to um, showing other people that this is something that I tend to be good at. Um, emails is another thing. Um, women, men tend to be much better about publicizing either by email, maybe to the firm or to the corporation and our law school to the faculty about this is what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to go be speak, I'm going to be speaking here. I'm going to, um, I just won this big case. I um, had negotiated this great fee with this client, um, that type of thing. Um, take advantage of email if that's a way that you can um, take, you can take credit for what you actually are involved with. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to send a mass email to your firm or your corporation saying, yay me, I'm great. Um, but it does mean sometimes that when you're sending um, emails to, for instance, maybe the head partner of your um, department or um, to the head of your faculty, whoever it is in your organization, um, that you're mentioning in there that, hey, this is something great that just happened. And it's good, always good for the firm and the organization as well. So for women, they tend to feel more comfortable phrasing it in that way, that, hey, we had, we had this great success um, with respect to this particular area. Um, a big reason why women, again, are uncomfortable with publicizing your credentials, for instance, one of the professors that I work with, um, I'm constantly nagging her because she'll do speaking engagements or um, she coaches the core team and she has great, they'll have great successes and then the email will come out from the dean saying, congratulations, Moot Court team, blah, 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 and her name won't be in there. And I, I, you're the one who led the Moot Court team, how can your name not be in there? She said, oh, it doesn't matter, it's, it's okay, it's fine. Like, the, the, he knows that I did it. Um, again, she kind of expects that life's going to be that meritocracy, that things are going to be fair and um, if she works hard, um, and gets the right successes that people will figure it out. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we all know that in the legal profession, people are busy. Um, it's not that they're intentionally ignoring your successes. It's that they're not aware of it. They might not be aware of it or they might not have had the chance um, to actually ponder it. Um, and if you give them um, that type of opportunity, they'll think about you perhaps in a different light. 
Um, moving on with negotiations. Another um, suggestion for negotiation is to be more confident in your negotiating ability. Um, with respect to women, as I said, a lot of this comes from our socialization and the fact that it's considered unpleasant to negotiate or haggle um, over particular terms, be it a new car, um, a new house, um, all the way up to um, asking for a salary. I mean, I know for me, for instance, I've never asked for a salary increase or for a bonus. I did always have that view that, yeah, I mean, if I work hard, I'll get my bonus, I'll get my salary increase. I don't think I should have to ask for it. I mean, that seems, if, if they think I deserve it, then I'll get it. That was generally my view. Um, and that seemed perfectly natural to me. Prepare any weak points ahead of time. So if you feel like you are going to feel uncomfortable um, throwing out numbers, if that's something that's kind of distasteful for you, or bluffing, prepare ahead of time. Preparation is something, especially for women, that had a high correlation with confidence. So if they were prepared, they tended to be much more confident once they walked into that particular arena. That being said, though, choose your battles. Um, you don't want to get carried away and walk out of here and negotiate every single thing for um, the rest of the day. No, I'm not, I'll take this elevator. You take the other one. Um, we don't, I'm not suggesting that. So you want to basically choose your battles with respect to when you are going to negotiate. And the purpose of that is that what you will have to say will have much more resonance then if you actually take your time and think about, OK, what's important to me? So this year is my salary number one on my list. Um, so prior, prior is a great thing. Um, or is my caseload something that's really bothering me? Is my office space something that's bothering me? What's your priority? And make sure that you're negotiating based on your priorities. Because you don't want to be known as someone that's running and complaining about every possible thing um, with respect to their work situation. Um, especially for women, again, um, we tend to feel, as I said, more comfortable negotiating on behalf of someone else. So you really have to tell yourself, why is that? Um, and that shouldn't be the case, of course. You should negotiate on behalf of yourself with the same passion um, that you would use to negotiate for another person. Um, and ask for what you truly want or what you truly need. So if you're on a case and you feel like you should be first chairing rather than second chairing, ask for it. Um, again, as I said, most of the anecdotal evidence suggests that this makes you more highly respected rather than less respected. Now, that being said, make sure that you truly feel that you deserve what you're asking for. I'm not suggesting that you should go around asking for outlandish things. If you're a second year associate, I don't think you should ask for the corner office. Um, that's not something that's realistic. But you, if you have a realistic need or demand, um, ask for what you truly want and what you truly need. Um, and then finally, finding the power of a positive no. Um, this is kind of a concept that's out there with respect to communication. A lot of commentators talk about this, that saying no is something that can tend to be very uncomfortable. And especially if you're working in a firm environment and any type of organization, there are lots of instances, often maybe sometimes every day, where you have to say no or you want to say no, um, but perhaps you avoid saying no because you don't want to alienate the audience or alienate those who um, are listening to you or um, who those who, who you have a good relationship with. Um, so I have a few suggestions. First, acknowledge the request. So you don't want, if, for instance, a senior partner is walking in your office saying, um, can you take on this new, you don't want to stop him in sentence and say, no, turn around and walk out. Um, that's not a great way to communicate and to make it clear that that person's been heard. So you want to communicate in a way that you're acknowledging the request. Um, but be clear in stating your no, and this is something that women are much, um, tend to score much lower on with respect to men, that they'll be like, mm, I'm kind of in the no-ish range, but, and then, I mean, if, you're leaving, if there's a range there, often someone will just go ahead and say, okay, let's go ahead and uh, give it to you anyway. If you're not sure that you can't take on this additional work, um, then why don't we go ahead and give it to you? So you need to be clear in saying, however, no, I can't take that on. Um, no, I can't work over this weekend. Um, and, but explain your no. Um, so again, don't just be arbitrary in saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, explain your no. So if it's taking on a new case, um, you would say, you know, I have this case that has this pressing deadline, I have this, and I have this. Um, and therefore, I, I couldn't get to this for another three weeks or so. 
Um, if you know, you're know you talking about working over the weekend, you might say, look, I have a wedding out of town that I cannot miss. Instead of saying that I really would prefer to not miss, it's my sister's, but I hope you won't give me this. Um, so you, know, you really want to um, be clear in saying your no and be clear in, in your explanation that, look, I don't really have, I'm sorry, I don't have a choice but to say no to you is essentially the, the best way to communicate it. And then offer an alternative that satisfies both of you. So if you can't work over the weekend, um, can you pick it up on, you know, can you stay later on Monday and Tuesday night when you come back? If it's taking on a new case, um, you can say, and this is what I would suggest to new associates at my firm when I would mentor them, is um, usually the word no doesn't go over very well with senior attorneys. But you can tell them when they come in, look, I have this, this, and this to do. So I can get to that in um, another week or so. So you're being very clear with them that no, I can't do this right now, but I am willing to come up with something that perhaps will satisfy both of our needs. Um, now, the good thing is a lot of times a partner will just say, okay, I'm just going to go elsewhere, which um, is usually what you want anyway. Um, but you do want to offer that type of alternative that satisfies both of your needs and makes it clear that this was a good communication between both of the parties. Okay, so those are my suggestions and my comments. I've been asked to leave a few minutes at the end here for questions, if anyone has any. Please wait for the mic. Thank you. I actually have two questions. One, this sounds like important stuff for new law students to learn, and is it somehow incorporated so that this can be communicated to them? And then secondly, you gave all these wonderful tips to, to women to how they can deal with these things. How about some tips for men who want to help them? I have two daughters, so you know. <laughs> for how to deal with women or to how to, how to how deal with them? Okay. Um, that, those are both great questions. First of all, for um, in the legal field, um, at, for instance, at Case Law School, we have had, I don't know if we're offering it this year, specific classes addressing the difference between gender. It's something that I think a lot of people are initially um, uncomfortable with. I know when I started, um, I worked at um, Squire Sanders for six years before coming to um, coming to the, the law school. And I know I was initially uncomfortable with women's luncheons or women's groups or things like that because I didn't want to automatically say there's a real difference between male attorneys and, and female attorneys. Um, but with respect to some of the things that um, people care about, for instance, family issues with uh, my students especially, they are much more adept than I was when, I mean, my friends and I, I remember when we were out for about seven or eight years, we said, why didn't we think about any of these things? Like, how are we going to have kids and raise them and still, you know, go and be in trial? Um, that's not something that we even thought about in, in law school. And most of um, our law students these days are much more savvy with respect to that. Um, so they will come and ask advice, um, but as far having particular classes on the difference in communication, that's actually a great idea and that should be something we should work on more. Um, as far as your second um, suggestion, I would say especially in dealing with um, your daughters or dealing with women is I, I think the best thing is to make it clear that there's not a difference. So to make sure that you're not communicating in a different way towards males than you are towards females. Um, I was in a good situation where um, I had uh, my, my dad had four girls, um, and he raised us all pretty much to say that there's no difference. You're going to have to work just as hard. Um, you shouldn't rely on someone else to take care of you. Um, so I want you all, he was a college professor, so he was very high on education. And he said, I want, you know, you all have to go to college. You all have to be able to support yourselves um, because that's just the way that the world works now. And so I think with respect to communication, the best thing I think is to be aware of it. Um, because so much of it is subtle. And people do not do, like for instance, this judge referring to the two female judges by their first name. Um, they're not, he's not doing it to be intentionally disrespectful. He doesn't realize that he's doing it. But the problem is that then the woman often comes away feeling somewhat disrespected compared to the other um, judges who are referred to as judge. So the best thing I think is to be aware of it and to try to make sure that your communication style doesn't differ depending on if you're speaking to men or women. Just going to bring you the mic. Okay, I liked your speech because I agree with a lot of things you said. Long ago, I was a union steward, and I always made sure I had a female sidekick with me because they would pick up on things that I missed and right. vice versa. I mean, 
So it was great. You know, sometimes we play good cop, bad cop, have that. <laughs> now, do you notice anything else about, shall we say, different communication styles between people of different races? Because also, I'd prefer to have a person of African, a woman of African American descent, be my sidekick because she picked up on great things I, that I blew off. Right. So do, do you notice that as well about uh, racial differences? Um, I think that's not something that I specifically studied, but I think that that's another thing that we um, should be sensitive to. And whenever you can be more inclusive, like you just said, all the better with respect to making specific remarks or it being in a leadership position to make sure that um, certain folks are in the right leadership position so their voice is being heard. Um, I think that's definitely important. Another thing that I would love to get into a little bit more is different societies in other words you know like the Chinese culture this culture that culture like what's the difference between because there's real gender differences generally regardless what culture you're in and as you're well aware some of the cultures it's amazing the differences between how females are even permitted to communicate um, compared to males but that's something I'm interested in kind of broadening my perspective to get into that as well um, have you uh, seen any studies regarding the impact of Title IX, and has that helped with just sports in general, uh, given, uh, giving females more opportunities at the collegiate level? Has that uh, led into the legal profession and had an impact? And secondly, have any studies been done regarding uh, citations for contempt of court, whether males are much more frequently uh, cited than females? Um, for your first question with respect to Title IX, um, one of the actual presentations that I did was for female faculty specifically. So I did look a little bit more into the school um, format. And what um, that talked about was the fact that Title IX has offered so many more opportunities for females compared to males. And this is something, when you talk about the difference that you see between the gender, this is a huge thing that I see with my students. I will often ask my students, how many of you participated in sports? And you can tell. You can tell the difference between those who did and those who didn't. And I don't mean that um, they're necessarily better um, because they part participated in sports, but it teaches you, and this is why I push all my children to do it, even if I don't care if you're riding the bench. What I care about is that you learn how to work on a team, that you deal with disappointment, that you be, can be collaborative. Um, because a big part of the legal profession, as you know, is working as a team. You're often, you're rarely completely on your own. And even when you are, you're often calling a friend or colleague for some type of advice. And for our law students who come in, they're not used to that. They're used to being very autonomous. Um, so when I first asked them to separate out and talk in small groups and brainstorm, the first class, uh, they're all looking at each other like, what are we supposed to do? I don't feel comfortable. And I don't know if I want to share my great ideas with them because um, then they'll steal my great ideas. So it's the, that whole kind of competitiveness, um, that culture that they have. Um, but those who have participated in sports and have that background tend to, um, if nothing else, they're they're much more amenable to criticism. They're not as uncomfortable when something gets criticized because they have a thicker skin often. They've dealt with that type of thing um, in the past. And then you had a second question. About the contempt of court. Oh, um, I did not see anything about that. I did see that judges have been um, chided in certain respects. Um, that's happened more often. Um, as you're probably still aware, I mean, some judges still have rules that women have to wear skirts in their courtroom, and they're, they're, that still takes place, um, you know, not a ton around these parts, but certainly in the United States, that's still um, a rule that some judges have. Um, but with some judges referring to, um, I read a lot of studies where judges would refer to um, the questioning attorney when she was female as, you know, girl or dear or things like that. And that has been brought um, under closer scrutiny, and they have been um, sanctioned for that um, in much higher respects than in the past. And so the same thing, I think, would, would apply for opposing counsel, that if opposing counsel is referring to them in derogatory terms. Um, as far as just contempt of court and how aggressive they are, I, I, I can't speak to that just because I didn't see them. <laughs> I would think, I would think that would make sense based on the findings that, that I saw. So I'm sorry I'm out of time, but thank you so much for coming today. It was wonderful to have such a great turnout.